video and we'll be able to uh, ask questions and interact with the, the speakers. Is everything all right with you guys in the room? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Alex, don't worry, you, you will hear the questions normally, but if needed, we will repeat them. So first we put the video and then you, uh, and you can watch the video on YouTube, it's easier. Okay. Hi everyone. This is a talk titled Top Prevalent Malware Migrates to macOS, or the story how from book turned into Exloder. First of all, let us introduce ourselves. My name is Raman and my colleague is Alexei. We are malware researchers from Checkpoint. This talk is divided into six chapters. We start with an overview of the malware. Then we speak about important milestones in the malware lifecycle. In the third chapter, we get our hands dirty with from book analysis we conducted four years ago and discuss the complications we encountered. Then we speak about Exloder analysis we conducted a year ago and compare it to Formbook. In the fifth chapter, we speak about network infrastructure and discuss its organization. As a final touch, we describe the Exloder version for macOS. And now let's start with an overview of the malware. Formbook can be described as a banker and a stealer, which is targeting more than 100 different applications. Though it's simple in the description, it is very sophisticated under the hood. Formbook is very high demand malware with a lifespan of six years and more than 3,000 campaigns. Formbook reached its peak in December 2020 when it was included into the top three malware prevalence list and was targeting 4% of organizations worldwide. More than 100 countries were attacked by Formbook in the last 12 months with India and Ecuador constituting one-fourth of all the victims worldwide. USA is on the third place with 7% of victims around the world. Now New Horizons opened up with a newly developed branch of Formbook, which is called Xloader. Xloader is able to target macOS along with Windows, which makes itself a significant milestone in malware evolution process for this reason alone. And now, after we got ourselves familiar with the malware, let's get some facts from its history. Formbook was first spotted in the wild in January 2016. Just one month later, Formbook started to be sold under underground form. October 2017, Formbook sales stopped abruptly, and we will get to this fact a bit later. In May 2018, Formbook also made his last post under underground form, vanishing into shadows. However, its activity has not stopped. In October 2020, Exloder started to be sold on their underground form. As indicated by Exloder's seller, Formbook also contributed a lot to the development of Exloder. However, two malware are different. And now it's time to speak about selling schemes of two malware and compare them. Formbook was offered for quite affordable prices, but the most interesting option was the possibility to obtain panel source code to be deployed on the customer's own domain. Speaking about Exloder, we still see the affordable prices, but there is no option of getting the panel source code. So, if we compare the selling schemes of two malware, we will notice only one but important difference. No source code of anything is available for sale anymore. And now let's get back to the event of stopping Formbook sales. As stated by Formbook Saucer, Formbook was meant to be a simple spyware, but customers started using it for massive spam campaigns. That's why Formbook sales were stopped, and users involved into such activity were banned. As a side note, we have to mention that Formbook Saucer and Exloder Seller are different avatars. And now we have two facts. Formbook sales stopped and Exloder selling scheme changed. And these two events may be actually connected. We discovered Formbook saucer email and analyzed it for connections with Formbook's campaigns and domains. We found three campaigns and 11 domains that have connections with this email. 
This led us to the conclusion that Formbox usage in massive spam campaigns interfered with the author's interests, as such activity increased the possibility of Formbook being detected by the antivirus vendors. We detected an in-the-wild activity of Formbook samples linked to these campaigns in 2020, three years after Formbook sales were stopped. And this fact actually supports our conclusion. Let's speak about formbook analysis we conducted four years ago and discuss the complications we encountered. But first, let's start with the approach we usually use for malware analysis before we get to the nitty gritty details. We start the analysis with checking used strings and function calls. Then, with the help of cross references to these key pieces, we reconstruct the logic of the application. However, in the case of Formbook, the whole process is not unfolding that simply. When we check the tab with functions, we don't see a single function there. Just like no function is being called inside, which is of course not true. After digging deeper, we see the mechanism of how the functions are called. Hash values are passed to the resolution function, and only then the target function is called. And strings don't make the analysis easier, as they are present only in an obfuscated form. Most of the strings are encrypted and we can see them. If we check if there are any meaningful strings inside at all, we will see these. And this is of course not informative at all. We discovered quite a few cryptographic algorithms inside, which are used both for internal encryption and network communication. For persistence, Formbook creates a random directory with a random executable name there. The malware uses random directory with random file names to store stolen data, which will be later sent to the server. So, as we have just seen, in brief form book can be described in just two words, obfuscation everywhere. Still, we needed to analyze this piece of malware, and so, despite all the obstacles and complications, we managed to analyze it with the help of the dedicated tools and patients. We managed to decrypt key strings used inside the malware and reconstruct cross-references to understand what are the places where the strings are used. We were also able to reveal the key functions used inside and understand from where they are used. We have completely reconstructed the form book execution flow and here is the theme. It all starts with the dropper which unpacks the malware. At this stage, the evasions are checked for the first time. Then, the first injection to the explorer process is performed. After this step, the malware makes an injection to a random system process. The evasions are checked inside this process for the second time. Also, at this step, the privileges are adjusted and the persistence is set up. Then, the injection to the explorer process is performed for the second time. Only at this point is the data grabbed and the communication with the command and control server established. Speaking about evasion techniques, Formbook implements a bunch of them. The first one is timing checks via a dedicated CPU instruction. The debug port is checked next. Formbook makes a snapshot of running processes and checks if any of them belong to the sandboxes. The same process is repeated for particular executable names that are usually used in sandboxes. Formbook also checks paths of loaded modules and, as a final touch, a username. A sophisticated technique implemented inside the malware is mapping of its own NTDLL copy. This trick renders all the hooks and API monitors useless even when they try to intercept the lowest function calls in user mode. During Formbook investigation, we found a slight weakness among all the traps it has prepared for the researchers. Formbook creates a mutex during the execution to prevent running of multiple copies. This mutex name depends on the username and is the same on the same machine no matter how many launches we made. For us, it meant that when Formbook samples were emulated in various total sandboxes, mutex names were always the same in the same sandboxes. We created a database of mutex names encountered in different sandboxes, and this greatly assisted us in uncovering more samples and tracking new ones. 
Speaking about network infrastructure, although we have re-implemented the network communication protocol, we have not discovered any alive command and control servers as none of them responded to our requests. We saw this course of events as a development opportunity for the batch analysis solutions that could assist us greatly and process a lot of samples automatically, extract indicators from there and help us create a more complete picture of the analyzed malware. And this is where the Xolder story starts. I'm now giving the microphone and the stage to Alexei. Thank you, Roman. In the next part of our presentation, we will tell you about the Farmbooks rebirth under the new name Xloader. When we saw Xloader ads for the first time, we thought that it was a completely new malware. It was advertised as a cross-platform botnet with InfoStiller functionality. We tried to find Xloader samples, but we couldn't because we didn't know how to search. In fact, at the time, we already had a large number of Xloader samples at our disposal. Uh, but we thought uh, it was a new version of Formbook because the samples are very similar and Xloader was detected as Formbook in our systems. Later on, we found specific signatures that allowed us to update our scripts to automatically distinguish between Xloader and Formbook, and even extract the malware version, encryption keys, and other useful data from samples. Xloader shares the Formbook's code base, and they have many similar functions, as you can see on this screenshot from Ida and Diaphora. They also use the same protection methods. The most important pieces of malware data in both Formbook and Xloader are stored encrypted in special buffers. The buffers are designed to look like a valid function code with a prolog and a return instruction at the end. Each encrypted buffer is preceded by a small function that is used to access the buffer. Some of the encrypted buffers contain data, while other buffers contain decryption keys. The CNC communication protocol also appeared to be very similar but slightly changed in Xloader. Xloader implements an additional encryption layer using the key stored in the malware configuration which is unique for each campaign. Therefore, it's impossible to decrypt Xloader network traffic without analyzing the sample. When we learned how to decrypt the data in samples, decrypt communication, we were able to develop automation for analyzing thousands of Xloader and for book samples. The samples are emulated in several sandboxes. We use them to extract memory dumps while the malware is running. This allows us to get unpacked samples regardless of the used packer or, or cryptor. The produced memory dumps uh, are processed by the malware conf configuration extractors. All the data uh, extracted from samples is stored in a sing single database, so-called MWDB. And uh, the entire process is orchestrated by the open source Carton system. During 2021 and 2022, in our system, we processed more than 20,000 Formbook and Xloader samples and extracted more than 4,000 unique malware configurations. The data we extract contain the list of accessed domains, campaign name, malware version, and encryption keys. We have collected a lot of data, but our goal was to find real CNC servers to know how effectively protect our customers. And this appeared to be really difficult. Now we will tell you why. The malware creators sell other cyber criminals access to their servers along with the malware binary. However, malicious servers remain invisible for a very long time. First of all, this happens because the malware disguises its communication by directing most of its traffic to more than 100,000 of legitimate servers. And if uh, and it may seem that uh, there is no way to distinguish a malicious server from a legitimate one accessed by the malware. Let's first take a look at how the Formbook CNC infrastructure works. When you run Formbook, it decrypts its configuration, which contains a list of 64 domain names and one URL. The malware randomly selects 16 of 64 domains from the list. One of them is replaced with the main domain. And the selected 16 domains are used for CNC communication. The malware sends check-in requests to all the selected endpoints. And the only situation where the response from the server is 200 OK is where the botmaster issues a command for a bot. However, a legitimate HTTP server may also reply with 200 OK to an Xloader request. Usually, CNC server replies with 404 not found error page. 
the same error you receive from any other websites when you try to access a wrong path. Uh, this all was related to Formbook, but Xloader configuration have the same structure. One encrypted buffer contains the main URL, another encrypted buffer contains a list of 64 domains. So, what are the 64 domain names from the configuration? Many of them look totally legit. They are regist registered at different time periods by different entities, and most of them return 404 error when malware communicates them. At first glance, we didn't see any overlap in this list between samples. For Formbook researchers uh, supposed that these domains are decoys, and the only one from the main URL is the address of a real CNC server. This was really true for Formbook. And we used to think that this works the same way for Xloader. With all the facts mentioned before, this assumption looks really reasonable. However, two facts made us doubt. The main domain uh, from each configuration appears only once and don't overlap between configurations. And uh, some of the websites pointed by these domains looked totally legit. When we compared thousands of Xloader configurations, we found an anomaly. We found several domains that appear in the list of 64 domains in different configurations multiple times. We collected as much as possible such domain names and tried to get more data about them. What we found out? Exactly one such domain is contained in every Xloader configuration and all the domains registered at the same registrar. Also, the domains registered less than a year ago and hosted at the same hosting in a close IP range. And one more important thing. If you try to open a root path on each of the hosts, it replies with the page that looks like an empty open directory. We believe that they are real CNC servers. Now, uh, if we find the entry point to the CNC panel on the servers, this will confirm our, our assumption. We assumed that Xloader panel should also share s some code with the Formbook panel. Therefore, we took the leaked Formbook panel source code to see how it should be accessed. Well, it appeared that we should use a path containing the campaign ID and use a valid account name as an argument for index.php. If we enter a wrong account name, the panel generates 404 error page. While testing the Formbook panel in our local web server, uh, we were glad to find that the error page generated by the PHP script differs from the page generated by the server itself. We found the same behavior on the supposed Xloader CNC servers. Unfortunately, after we published our findings, uh, the malware creators fixed this issue. Well, one step is left to finally prove that we found the real CNC servers. We need to find or guess a valid account name to see the CNC panel login form instead of 404 error page. But how to do that? We came up with the following trick. We have collected the nicknames of Hackforms users who contacted Xloader sellers. Then we tried to access the supposed CNC servers by domain names from the collected list and using the known campaign IDs extracted from Xloader samples and the collected nicknames. After a few minutes, we got lucky to find an active account name and we saw the Xloader login page. This was really great success. Using the nickname, we also found an open directory containing the panel scripts and uh, static files. But wait, we told you that 16 of 64 domains are selected randomly. One of them is replaced with the main domain, which is also um, appeared to be a decoy, as we have just seen. Therefore, the probability of the event when CNC server appears in the list of 16 selected domains should be less than 25%. Really? This is confusing, because this logic significantly reduces the reliability of the botnet. But actually, we were wrong. We decided to emulate the sample in a sandbox and we were surprised. First of all, we saw requests only to 15 domains in the network traffic instead of expe expected 16. And after more than 30 emulations, we haven't seen the expected domain in the network traffic at all. 
It was a time to investigate how Exploder creates a list of 16 domains. It wasn't easy because the part of the code which is responsible for this logic is additionally in encrypted in the malware and you can find it decrypted only when it runs injected into a system process. It appeared that uh, when Exploder creates a list of 16 domains, two of them are replaced. One with the main domain, which is actually another decoy, and the second with the real CNC domain, which is hidden among uh, 63 decoys. Uh, the quote on, this, on the screenshot explains why we didn't see the communication with the real CNC domain in the sandbox. The first six attempts to connect the real CNC server are skipped. Exloader uses delays of five seconds between uh, connection attempts. The, four, the first connection attempt to the real CNC server is performed after approximately from eight to 10 minutes. We didn't see them in a sandbox because the emulation timeout was less than five minutes. The dom domain name selection scheme for CNC lookup is as follows. The malware accesses uh, 14 random decoy domains, one special decoy domain, and only after from 8 to 10 minutes it accesses the real CNC server. If we run the malware in a sandbox for 10 minutes, we see that in the first six loops, the delay between some requests is 10 seconds, while all other delays are 5 seconds. This way we can find uh, the skipped request after six attempts to the after six attempts, the expected requests to uh, the real CNC server appear in the network traffic. After we published our research uncovering Exploder CNC infrastructure in 2021, cybercriminals released a new version of the malware, Exploder 2.5. The main changes in this version are intended to make its CNC servers even more, more stealthy. As before, Exploder chooses 16 random domains from its configuration. But if we compare Exploder 2.5 with the previous version, we see that now they replace three domains in the list of 16 selected domains instead of two, like it was in the version 2.3. Therefore, now the list uh, of accessed domains looks as follows. Three randomly chosen domains in the list are replaced. The first one with the domain from the main URL, which is a decoy. The second with another decoy from the big list of 64 domains. And the third with the real CNC domain, which is also taken from the list of 64 domains from the configuration. This already looks confusing, but that's not all. Exploder 2.5 overrides first eight domains in the list after each communication cycle with a new randomly chosen domains. We also should pay attention to the fact that the index of the real CNC server is not saved. And if it appears in the first part of the list, it will be overwritten and won't be accessed during the next communication cycle. However, there is uh, still a probability that this domain will appear in the list again. This is possible because eight domains that override the first part of the list are chosen randomly, and the real CNC domain might be one of them. In this case, the probability that a real CNC server will be accessed in the next uh, cycle is approximately from 10 to 12 percent depending on the position of the second fake CNC domain. At first glance, we again could think that uh, this behavior reduces the reliability of the botnet. However, let's look at the next table. Assuming the time between communication cycles is approximately uh, 90 se seconds, uh, we counted the probabilities of real CNC server being not accessed again with a given time frame. It appears that uh, the real CNC domain will be accessed once in approximately 14 minutes and uh, in the worst case it will be accessed once in two hours with, with almost 100% probability. <clears throat> the root page of the CNC servers is now disguised as a parquet domain page of one of well-known service providers. Uh, however, there are some features that uh, still allow us to easily distinguish a fake page displayed by the CNC server from the page generated by the service provider. Uh, you can see them on the screenshot. So let's sum up. We managed to find approximately 120 real CNC servers. And actually this is a needle in a haystack in comparison to the number of legitimate servers. Uh, there is no difference in the network communication with legitimate and malicious servers. 
and the malware poses legitimate servers in the configuration as malicious. That's why real malicious hosts remain undetected for a very long time, while security vendors may mistakenly block legitimate servers. And now about Exloder for macOS. In 2021, Exloder expanded its activities to macOS, and uh, as we told you before, it was first advertised on Hack Forums in 2020. The macOS version of Exloder is sold cheaper uh, than the Windows version. However, it probably wasn't such popular. We were unable to find the macOS sample in the wild for a long time. Also, it was difficult to invent how to search macOS samples if we didn't know what they looked like and how they behaved. Uh, it was a good idea to use the collected list of CNC domains for Exloder for Windows in a virus total query. And we were lucky to catch the first uh, Exloder sample for macOS in the end of, the, of June 2021. Expectedly, it had zero detection rate. The macOS and Windows variants of Exploder are really similar. This is good for us uh, because this allows us to use similar rules to hunt malicious samples and use slightly changed script to extract malware configuration. However, Exploder for macOS have some features. For example, it uses different decryption flow for the strings and configuration data and uh, it looks even more tricky than the version for Windows because the buffers are encrypted in three layers in comparison to the Windows version where they are encrypted in two layers. The communication protocol of the macOS variant and its uh, list of supported commands is compatible with uh, Exloder for Windows. Also, both macOS and Windows variants of the malware share the same command and control infrastructure. This allows malware operators to use a single panel to manage macOS and Windows bots. And now to the conclusion. Roman? Thank you, Alexei. Let's recall the key facts we have spoken about. We researched very prevalent malware with no skills required to use. More than 100,000 legitimate servers were abused during the course of malware operations. Such legitimate sites may be mistakenly blocked by security vendors who may treat them as malicious. The malware is now targeting macOS as opposed to the early versions which were targeting only Windows. If you're interested in getting more details on this research, you're welcome to check our research page where we have three articles present on this topic. You're also welcome to visit our Evasions Encyclopedia where real anti-analysis techniques are grouped by different categories along with the usage samples and thorough descriptions. This concludes our presentation and thank you so much for your attention. Okay, now the tricky part. Okay, you're still there. Good. So can you try your microphone, Alexei? Hello. Oh, great. Yeah, hello. Oh, cool. So now for questions in the room. Yes, sir. So introduce yourselves because yeah, um, Vitaly, Vitaly Kamluk from Kaspersky. I'm curious about, can you hear me? One, two, three. Guys, can you hear the question? Uh, yeah, not, question? not that uh, thoroughly, but uh, we, can, <laughs> we can try to answer. Okay, um, question is about the macOS version of Xloader. Can you tell uh, if it also has persistence mechanism and what does it use on macOS for persistence? Uh, yes, it, it has persistence uh, mechanism. Um, actually, it's usual for uh, any macOS malware. Um, probably, I can't, I can't definitely say what it is now. Um, uh, actually, it's, it's the same for all macOS malware. Okay, so it's it's typical typical persistence. 
Yes. Mechanism. Okay. Thank you. Introduce yourself, Tom. Yes, this is Tom from Swiss Post. Thanks for the excellent presentation video. Um, did I understand this correctly that in the form book uh, configuration, the, the real C2 domain is, is um, distinguished or you can distinct from, from the decoys and in the X loader, they, they mixed it up in the decoy list, so is it easier to find the, the real C2 domain in, in the form book configuration? Or is, is that a misunderstanding? Uh, in form book of old versions, uh, the real CNC server uh, is stored separately in the configuration. You can easily find it. Uh, it's it stored in the separate buffer uh, in the like main URL. Um, in the latest version of Formbook, uh, they moved to the uh, scheme that uh, was also used in the first version of Xloader. Uh, but later, uh, as, as we told, um, uh, Xloader was upgraded heavily and uh, now actually it's very difficult uh, to find uh, real synthesis servers for Xloader. But if you know how the configuration uh, looks like, um, when you know what to search uh, in the malware, you, you can find the real synthesis server very easily, uh, even with the automatic scripts. Okay, thank you. So you need to decrypt uh, a few buffers. Uh, you need to decrypt uh, a part of the code which is executed uh, in, in the system process in the Explorer. And uh, you can extract the index of the uh, real CNC domain. And uh, this, this index uh, actually points to the CNC domain. It was a tricky question. <laughs> Another question? Come on, guys. They understood everything. Tom has another question. One more question, yeah. Um, so are there available config extractors that work on both uh, Formbook and the X, X loader? Or do you have to write totally different config extractors for each? Uh, we have one configuration extractor for both uh, Formbook and Xloader, um, but um, uh, there are two different flows uh, in the extractor uh, because, um, it, uh, as, as far as I remember, Xloader has uh, um, more buffers containing the decryption keys and um, um, the the encryption flow is a, a bit different. Okay, thanks. But it's, it's uh, very similar, so uh, we can reuse uh, part of the code uh, which we're using for, for book. Yeah, well, while there are some differences are present, uh, there is no necessity to create separate structures and uh, just uh, slight tweaks uh, to what already existed could be made. and. Uh, it allowed us to make uh, one uh, universal extract. Okay, any other question? One, two, three. Oh, Vitaly has another question. <laughs> question machine. Sorry, I just thought about, um, given, given that Xloader uh, switched to this uh, model where they don't offer um, the buyers of the kit to have own panel so that they kind of can aggregate all the data of all, of all their clients uh, using their own server, if I understood correctly. That means the, the owners of the Xloader have access to all the credentials that are stolen, right? Um, is there any mechanism in the malware to prevent this from being stolen on the server side? Is there any kind of you know key that the, the client can include to protect this data? Or maybe you have seen that these credentials are actually being stolen and traded and pop up anywhere else on the marketplaces, perhaps. 
Actually, <clears throat> from what we saw in the dark net, the community is pretty reliable, if we can use this word for dark net community. And uh, there were uh, the exact uh, same questions uh, asked to Xloader sellers. Uh, what about the credentials? Uh, can we trust you? Because the subscription is time limited and what will be with our botnets after uh, this time expires. Uh, but there were no cases of uh, dumped credentials of something uh, stolen and abused. Uh, we have no uh, observed any, any of these cases. And from what we uh, see recently, the community is pretty active. Uh, the sales are continuing and uh, the campaigns uh, uh, appear, the new campaigns appear. So uh, this uh, whole system is working and uh, uh, what we think is that uh, Xloader sellers are pretty um, clear in the in intentions. They sell their services and there is no need for them to do uh, anything um, to the credentials or something like this. So uh, it's, uh, it's a trustful server <laughs> if we can use this word again for the Darknet community. Thanks, that makes it clear. Um, and um, is there any assessment of how big is the community? Are we talking uh, about hundreds or thousands? of potential clients of theirs? Uh, we can judge about the clients by the number of campaigns. And uh, what we saw for Xloader, it's about two, it's more than two and a half uh, thousand campaigns. And uh, some customers are recurring, so they uh, buy subscriptions uh, once again, and some customers are new. So um, we can't really say uh, who are new uh, and who are returning customers, but uh, we see that the, the activity is pretty persistent and uh, the campaigns are appearing steadily across the months. For example, if we take uh, the last year, we see a steady appearance of uh, new campaigns. So there is no drop, there is uh, no rise, uh, just um, the whole steady scheme is operating. Okay. Any other question? Yes, in the front. Okay, this, this will be the last question. Don't forget to introduce yourself. They don't see you. Uh, Chris Wakelin from Proofpoint. Um, so if you use a form book config extractor and get this unique URL, the one that uh, was, was put into form book, and do that on Xloader, is that going to be, that'll be a decoy domain, but would it be a legitimate domain? Sorry, we didn't hear you. So, yeah, could, could you please repeat because it was not quite clear. So if you... Uh, use the same technique for extracting the original, um, the actual unique URL, as opposed to the decoy ones that gets put into Formbook, but you do that on Xloader. Is that a decoy domain, or is that one that is, uh, 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 could it be legitimate? Because uh, you say, well, the decoy domains mm -hmm. are, 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 could be legitimate domains, but you have this unique URL those, that gets added to the, well, it takes, one of them, doesn't it? And then two from the decoy domains now. Uh, do, do you mean, can we judge uh, about uh, whether a domain is decoy or real by uh, the IP address? No, uh, I mean, if you, if, if you uh, extract the original domain, you know, the unique domain that, uh, um, that would have worked for Formbook would have been the real C2 for Formbook, but you do that for Xloader, then is that domain going to be a decoy domain and uh, possibly legitimate, or is it going to be uh, um, just another, you know, going to go nowhere? I don't think I managed to explain that. Is, so the, the question is, is the, the technique used for the first one, uh, extracting a domain that would be legitimate for the other or not, to simplify? One uh, could you answer? Yeah, um, Mac, uh, I, I apologize, but I, I didn't uh, get uh, the meaning. Could you please uh, maybe repeat or rephrase? Yeah, um, Mac, Mac says it, it will be a decoy domain, so he's answered my question. <laughs> so Mac, Mac in the in the room answered it will be a decoy domain. <laughs> we, we just uh, didn't uh, hear the question clearly. It was yeah. difficult. Yeah, it was sorry. a tricky question going in different directions. Um, okay, guys, um, would you like, I'll, I'll put my video on so maybe you can see me. Um, do, you, do you have a, la a last word for uh, the audience? Uh, 
Uh, well, it's a pity we couldn't be present uh, at the event. Uh, I was attending the conference four years ago and it was a great experience. And unfortunately, uh, the events in our country turned out that way that we couldn't get a visa. And so uh, mm, we were forced to stay here. And uh, we would like to thank you for giving us a chance to make a remote presentation and to be a part of this great event. And uh, we wish you the good time and uh, all the good uh, atmosphere there. It's uh, really cool. We can even feel it uh, by emails and uh, uh, the whole <laughs> the whole schedule. Thank you, Alex. Mm, I have nothing to add, but uh, thank you very much uh, for this conference. I like it very much. Okay. Thank you, guys. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.